Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Dan. I'm uh, one of the founding directors of Shambhala Festival. Um, uh, and so I'm here to tell you, well, to tell you a story about Shambhala Festival, I suppose. I'll start off by a bit of a <clears throat> whistle-stop um, history of Shambhala and then uh, go into a bit of actually our um, uh, sustainability focus of what we've achieved with the festival. <clears throat> so, where to begin? <laughs> Um, once upon a time, all the way back in 1990s, four like-minded friends met at Birmingham University. A few of us were studying African studies and uh, we set up a, um, a, a regular music night called Africa Jam um, uh, to raise money for various charities and to celebrate African culture in a much more positive light. Um, uh, we started putting on more and more ambitious events that culminated in our graduation party. Um, uh, which was, well, incorporated a friend's field down in Exeter, a PA we stole, uh, I mean, borrowed from uh, our students' union, um, a, a next door neighbour's trailer, and 150 of us um, uh, revelled the weekend away. And it gave us a real taste for what we wanted to do. So, after graduating, um, uh, we thought what we needed to do to stay in the events industry and to carry on um, uh, essentially giving out a positive message, we thought we'd set up a record shop. Um, uh, this was up in Birmingham, in Moseley, and uh, it was to act as our base of operations. So it wasn't only just a record shop, it was a cafe, it was an art gallery, it was a PA hire company, and also it was the headquarters of our promotions company. Um, it, we ran this for 10 years, um, uh, probably the worst time in history to set up a record shop, and uh, we never made any money, and eventually we had to close. But at the end of the day, without this window to the world and the opportunity to meet people, make contacts, make networks, Shambhala would never be what it is today. So um, in 2000, um, uh, we wanted to do another summer party. Um, uh, and this was called Shinge La. It was over in Cambridgeshire. Um, it was a beautiful bit of a beautiful farm with Tudor buildings, peacocks and um, swimming pool and stuff like that. And uh, it was fantastic. Um, about 500 people came and it was a huge success. But then the next year in 2001, our summer party, we thought we'd take it back out, back out from the barns and stuff into a um, totally green field. And we did that in the Blackdown Hills. And that was when it was first came called Shambhala. We stumbled across this name. I'll just make a little mention on the name. We stumbled across the name somewhat by accident. Shamba means field in Swahili, or productive land in Swahili. And we added Lara at the end to tie it in with Shinge La the year before. Um, uh, and then it was several months afterwards that we actually discovered what Shambhala actually is, which is, for those that don't know, it's a mythical Buddhist kingdom steeped in, um, uh, well, it's, um, just held in high reverence of this um, place of peace and unity and positivity. And uh, we never would have had the audacity to have named it Shambhala had we known um, uh, what it actually was. But in actual fact, it's probably the most um, amazing and apt name for um, our festival. So... Um, uh, the first Shambhala had about a thousand people um, uh, and over the next five years um, it grew to over five thousand people, primarily, well, purely through word of mouth. Um, we never did any advertising, no promotion or anything like that and it was just, um, it, yeah, word of mouth. But 2005 was a bit of a crunch year. Um, uh, firstly, um, uh, about two miles away from the site there was a quarry and uh, we'd had arrangements with them to stop all of the lorries coming down and blocking our single access track. And they didn't keep to that. So we had lorries just coming down all the time when we had 5,000 people trying to arrive. We had tailbacks that stretched all the way through Plimpton onto the A38. It was mentioned on Radio 1 saying Shambhala Festival must be kicking off because there's tailbacks and all of that. There were people on websites saying how to break into the site. And so we just got stormed by people just breaking in. And uh, really, we were a bit, a bit lucky to get away with it, to be honest. Um, uh, we were so far over capacity and our management structure was close to breaking point. Um, but we made it through. Um, uh, but really, it was time um, uh, to take stock and so we took a year off 
um, uh, just to essentially dampen down um, uh, the success, the, the, not the success, but the, um, uh, the interest in it. We really wanted to keep it small, keep it um, intimate. And we obviously needed to address our management structure, especially if it was going to grow a bit. And we had to find a new site because this quarry was seriously problematic. And so we found this beautiful site up in Northamptonshire called Kelmarsh Hall. And we've been there ever since 2007. So this year was our eighth festival on this site. And in that time, it's grown from about 5,000 people to 12,000 people. And uh, we reckon that's our optimum size. We've got no wish to grow it um, in, for the short term, at least. And it's amazing. It's still an intimate event, um, uh, but it's big enough so you can get lost if you want to, but it's small enough so you can find everybody again if you wish to as well. Um, uh, so, on to this year, Shambhala 2014. Um, uh, well, it was by far the most successful event we've put on yet. Um, uh, we sold out two months in advance, um, uh, which is just, yeah, just took us all by, um, uh, just, we were all in shock by this. Um, uh, it was just, the, the management was amazing. The atmosphere was, um, uh, it, it was the best yet. It was just packed to bursting, full of entertainment and creativity and fun and games. And we managed to survive the weather again, um, uh, which is always quite a big factor. So, uh, just want to talk about a few things about what makes Shambhala Shambhala, what makes it so special. Um, uh, firstly, our main intention has always been to throw the best party that we possibly can. Now, that party incorporates so many different things. Um, uh, one of the roots of it is that we, it must be sustainable. Um, uh, we've always been committed to running um, uh, the most sustainable event we can. It almost underpins every decision we make, from uh, um, innovations that we uh, um, bring to the festival to reduce our impact, to partnerships with key suppliers, to engaging and communicating with the public. And really, basically, we just see it as our responsibility to make everything we do have as little impact or as positive an impact as we possibly can. Um, another very important thing about Shambhala is um, uh, the participation um, uh, of everybody that's there. Um, uh, it's not just a passive crowd soaking up. Um, uh, just entertainment and uh, not being challenged in any way. We want to engage the audience. We want to educate the audience. And so there's so many different ways of people getting involved. Here you've got an um, organised um, cycle ride to Shambhala, and about two or 300 people have done that a a for the past three years. And here you've got um, uh, a dance workshop, which is actually power ballad yoga, believe it or not. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, festivals, um, as, as was mentioned, um, uh, was it Katie, um, uh, through the arts, it's just a great way to communicate with people. Um, it's there, they're captive, and they are susceptible to new ideas. <coughs> We've always also aimed for it to be um, a hugely family-friendly event um, uh, for several reasons. They, obviously, they are our future, so we want to engage them as well with any messages that we do put across. But also they provide an amazing balance to the party. That they make everybody act much more sensibly and with responsibility. And, uh, and it provides just a lovely balance to the um, hedonism ev everywhere else. Obviously as well, there's a huge amount of performance and creativity. But we don't look to put on massive headline acts, um, which cost a fortune and would make the event unsustainable. Um, uh, we would probably have to take on sponsorship and then we'd be dependent on their, de de um, uh, their demands and we'd much rather um, be independent and, uh, um, uh, and have our own, well, be the holes of our own destiny. Um, uh, the people that are involved from the crew are just absolutely key. They are loyal and dedicated. And it's our responsibility to look after them as well, to make them sustainable in what they do. Um, we always see that Shambhala is a vehicle through which we can facilitate people's dreams, be it an art installation, be it a performance, be it some kind of creativity of any description. Um, uh, so looking after them is, cru is crucial. And so many of them have stayed with us from the beginning, all the way back in the early days until now. 
The other side of the people are the crowd. Um, uh, we've got an amazing audience at Shambhala. Once again, so loyal. They keep on coming back year after year. And they truly feel a sense of ownership over the festival as well. They actually buy into this event and they believe in what we're doing. And uh, so on their way home from, uh, from this year, so many will have been talking about what fancy dress they're going to have next year. And they're like that, that. They've become, yeah, somewhat obsessive. But, and also, oh yeah, I forgot I had this, but also it's full of surprises. Um, it, it just keeps people guessing all the time and it keeps them engaged. But turning to um, a few specifics, particularly our um, uh, focus on sustainability. Um, uh, as I mentioned, it's always been a building block of what we do. Um, uh, we're always striving to reduce the festival's environmental footprint. And uh, every year we do an incredibly thorough carbon, foot carbon audit. And so between 2009 and 13, we managed to reduce the festival's CO2 emissions per person per day, which is kind of the industry standard of how you measure it rather than as a festival as a whole. And we reduced that by 81% over four years. And during that time as well, we reduced overall emissions of the festival by 70%, despite an increase in numbers. Um, by far the biggest environmental impact that the festival has in terms of just carbon emissions is um, uh, the travel of the public. Um, uh, so this year, 12,000 people travelling God knows how many miles. It's a huge, um, it, well, it's a huge proportion of what we do. I think it was, yeah, 87% of the footprint from 2013. Um, and we've, the, the, it, it brings up questions. Whose responsibility is that? Is that our responsibility or is it the, how, or is it the public's responsibility? The public at Shambhala hugely believe it's their responsibility. I think 87% last year thought 90% of, of our audience see it as their responsibility. But we can't ignore that. Um, uh, if we weren't putting on this festival, then they weren't travelling. Um, uh, so it's not something we can ignore. But it's also one of the hardest things of actually trying to tackle. How do you get people out of their cars? When they're going to, they might have families, all of their stuff, all of their kit. The convenience of being able to travel when you want is just somewhat overpowering. We continue to try to come up with initiatives, um, uh, such as we subsidise coaches coming from all around the country to come there. We organise shuttle buses from the nearest train station to the festival, and they're free. We organise the cycle rides and things like that, and so provide as much opportunity as people to, for people to travel to there without having such an impact as using their cars. And also, but it's really, it's a huge question for the wider world as well, not just festivals and not just Shambhala, how to get people out of their cars. One thing that we do have tight control over, though, is how we generate the power for the festival on site. And uh, for the past five years, um, we've been using um, uh, recycled veg oil in biodiesel generators. And uh, it works fine. It's very good. Um, uh, but this year, we employed a new company called Firefly. They're based in Brighton, and I highly recommend anybody looking them up because they are fantastic, very forward-thinking. And they've, over the past year or so, they've put in a huge amount of investment into new generators, which are hybridised. So they've got solar panels that charge up batteries. The batteries are used, and then when they are depleted, that's when the biodiesel kicks in. And it's all locally sourced veg oil um, uh, biodiesel. It's not, yeah, imported. Um, at the expense of God knows what. Um, uh, and uh, this was the first year that we gave them their, this job, this contract. And uh, importantly, it's another aspect of what Shambhala does is actually invest in innovation and invest in new forward-thinking companies and building relationships with them. But perhaps our biggest achievement, or the achievement that I'm most proud of in actual fact, and uh, largely that's had the largest effect, was last year we introduced a scheme called Bring a Bottle. And so, in essence, we banned the sale and supply of plastic water bottles um, throughout the site. So you couldn't buy them, the crew didn't get them, not even artists on stages. Instead, we put in um, uh, chilled, water, uh, chilled filtered water taps throughout the festival site, made water so easy to get. You get it from all the bars for free, um, uh, and we provided water bottles, um, uh, so that, uh, very, very cheap water bottles, so you could have your permanent water container and then take them away. 
It was a huge excess, and uh, we easily, um, well, we stopped um, uh, at least 10,000 water bottles being used and just discarded and thrown away. And it also makes the site cleaner, which makes a better environment. And, uh, and another um, positive ramification of it was, was we made such a big deal about water. And there seemed to be a noticeable um, improvement in the vibe and the nature of everybody that was there. And I've got a hunch that it was because everybody was more hydrated. And so the hangovers weren't as bad. And people were just drinking more water. And they were just more, um, uh, and I think everybody was just happier because of it as a bit of a sideline. Alongside this, um, uh, we also um, ran a reusable cup scheme at the bars. Um, uh, and so um, the, when you arrive, you, when you get your first drink, you pay a pound deposit. And then every time you bring that pint, that cup back, you get a new one. And we store all of the dirty cups. And they go off to a big depot to get washed. And this alone saved over 100,000 plastic cups just being used once and then discarded or um, into the waste stream. So looking at our key targets for this year, um, uh, we wanted to increase our recycling rate to 75%. Um, uh, at the moment, I can't give you any stats on this. We're still um, uh, yeah, doing the maths on our waste stream. It's quite a complicated thing. We need figures back from the local. Uh, it's far too complicated to figure out just now. We wanted 100% renewable power rather than 90% or so thereabouts the year before, and we achieved that. We wanted to up um, people traveling on coaches from 10% to 15%. We didn't quite make it. We got to 13%, which is a step in the right direction, but it's not good enough, and we need to work on that further. And also, obviously, no disposable plastics on site. We'd kind of achieved that last year, but the implicate, the, um, uh, we improved the delivery of this service, and, uh, and, and the, the buy-in, once again, from our public is huge, and they really, truly believe in it. So going, looking forward to the future, so 2015. Um, at the moment, it's too early to tell what our initiatives are going to be. We need to really assess all of these, our key targets from this year that we haven't done yet before looking forward. But we will come up with yeah, new targets and push ourselves and challenge ourselves further. Um, that's pretty much it. But I just wanted to um, uh, really, it's, it's a final thought, as Darren was saying, it's about, this today is about green narratives. And uh, while I was writing this, um, uh, or thinking about this presentation, um, I came across a really interesting article by George Marshall. And he said, like the cycles that govern global energy and carbon systems, public attitudes are subject to positive feedback effects that can amplify small changes and result in rapid shifts. Strong visible protest and increased media coverage can break the climate silence and create wider engagement. Above all though, we need to recognise that the narrative we choose will shape what happens from now on. The very best story would be one of a common purpose based around our shared humanity. It's about offering a vision and it's about offering um, uh, stories that people buy into. Stories inspire. Stories inspire people from, you know, from tiny until they're old and it's, it's inescapable that. <coughs> and I think Shambhala's story achieves a lot of these things, albeit in a microcosm. It's a very small event on a very large, um, looking at a very large problem. And so really, I hope that today helps develop everyone's own narrative that together can create a larger story to achieve the change that is desperately needed. Thank you.